Please to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 in your scriptures. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, this is the parable of the sower. Beginning in verse number 3, the Bible says, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth, and when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it was withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear." Let us skip down to verse number 14 to where Jesus, I need to move this up a little bit. Oh, is it off? Okay. I look up there and the sound guy's waving at me. That's never a good sign. Is that good? Am I on now? One, two, three. Something's on. In our church, we meet in a banquet hall and it's a small room and everything echoes. The ceiling is stainless steel, so my voice carries very well. And um, I, don't, I don't use a microphone, so this is actually unusual for me. All right, if we're good now, let's continue reading. When Jesus explains the parable, verse number 14. The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. And when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it become unfruitful." And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. I want to speak to you tonight on the subject of reaping a harvest in a barren land. Schuylkill County is a coal county. Uh, it is a very rocky county. We have a lot of rocks. I remember growing up in my, uh, in my parents' garden, there were always these little stones that were, that were on the top, and sometimes I would rake the stones off to the sides. In farmers' fields, uh, we have large piles of rocks that line the edges of the field because the soil is so rocky, the farmers have pulled them out on the edges and, and, and they, they just cast them off to the side. In fact, my dad, years ago, he decided that he wanted to make his own rock patio. And uh, what we did is we would go out to the farmer's fields and we'd fill the back of the truck with the rocks that my dad thought were pretty rocks. And we'd, we'd carry them back to the back of my dad's place and, and we built a very large rock patio. And uh, he's had competitions in the past where people can go around and guess which rocks were the, uh, were the heaviest. And we know which ones are heaviest because our backs felt them. Me, my dad, and, uh, and, and my brother. Um, farmers have told me that in Schuylkill County, the soil for farming is not that is not that good. The county below us is Berks County, and the county beside Berks County is Lancaster County. Maybe you're familiar with Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Maybe some of you have been there. I've been told that the soil in Berks County and Lancaster County is 40 percent more productive than the soil in Schuylkill County. Uh, the soil really does make a big difference. A barren land is difficult to, to raise a harvest in. We live in a barren land. 
And there are preachers that I've, I, I've spoken with, and many of them are, are older preachers, and they, they talk about the good old days. And, and I, I've, I've been to churches, and some of these churches sprang up very quickly. And dozens, maybe hundreds of people got saved within a few short years. Uh, one of my professors in college shared about how years ago he showed up to Canada at a church. And uh, this is not a reflection of Pastor Stockton at all. But he, he, he was candidating at a church. First Sunday there, he, he preached a message and 26 people got saved. Right there at the very first service. And, it said, and he said, it wasn't a gospel message. He says, the people were so hungry for the truth that, that uh, they, 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 there were visitors there that day. 26 people got saved. And he decided, I need to stay here just to disciple these, these people. And he saw the size of that church double just within a couple of years. We don't live in a, in a land like that. And it's not because God is a different kind of a God. I really believe that the land in America is barren. Uh, I've been told not only by Pastor Stockton, but by other pastors who have ministered in the Northeast, that the Northeast, the New England states, is a hard region to minister to. Uh, I, I've been down south, and you know, the south is a hard region to minister to as well, because there may be a lot more believers down there, uh, uh, up here. You go down south, everybody's a believer, or at least they think they are. You, know, you, you walk up to someone and they're sitting on your front porch and they, they're drinking a beer and, you know, they got profanity on their shirt. And you go up and you start talking to them and, and they says, oh, yeah, I'm the, I'm the deacon at the First Baptist Church down the road here. And you just got to scratch your head and wonder. And, and, and they're so Christianized that they're completely lost. Every, every part of the country, Nevada, is gonna, it, has, it will have its own challenges. I've heard people tell me about places in the West, how the people are very independent-minded. They, they, they don't need the, the big cities. They don't need all these things. They just want to be left on their own. And, and, and for that matter, they don't need God either. We live in a barren land. But is it possible to reap a harvest in a barren land? I say absolutely yes. You see, we serve a great God, and our God is greater than any barrenness that we may experience. Now, I'm just going to explain briefly this parable, but what I want to get at is some application of this parable. I want to talk about how we can indeed reap a harvest in a barren land. Let me just explain it real quick. The sower, of course, is the believer. And the seed is the Word of God, but for our purposes tonight, the seed is the gospel. Because if someone's going to believe the Word of God, they first need to believe the gospel. If they don't believe the gospel, then, then they will not understand anything else in the Word. The seeds planted by the wayside are devoured by birds. And this represents Satan's work preventing people from being saved. The seeds planted in the stony ground are scorched by the sun. And as Jesus explains, this represents those who make a profession of faith in Christ... But they turn away when the Christian life becomes difficult. So maybe they claim to be a Christian. Maybe, maybe they prayed a prayer, but problems arose and they decided to turn away. The seeds planted in the thorny ground are choked out by weeds. And this represents those who make a profession of faith in Christ, but they love the world more than God, and they thereby become more unfruitful. And of course, the seeds planted in the good ground, they thrive and they bear fruit. And this represents those who believe in Jesus for salvation and they bear fruit as a good Christian should. Fact, very few people are getting saved these days. Some are, but there's not many. I have 17 members in my church. We started with five all but one of the, 70, of the others that have been added have been added through salvation and baptism. And I praise the Lord for each person that has been added. But there should be a lot more. I had a conversation with my dad, who my father is part of the church. And I had a conversation with him about a year and a half ago. And I said, you know, 40 years ago, this family would have gotten right with God and they'd be part of the church. 40 years ago, this person would have realized that they're a sinner and they would have called out to Jesus Christ for salvation. 40 years ago, this person would have actually come to church and he would have listened to a gospel presentation. But people are so hard that they're not responding. Very few people are getting saved. What is the problem? The problem is that the land is barren. What is the solution? I'm going to talk about this in a few moments. So the solution is that more laborers are needed. 
And based upon this parable and the Bible's teaching on sowing and reaping, I want to give you four applications or four things that you can do to improve your harvest. If the harvest seems barren, don't throw in the towel. Don't say, it's, it's just hard, we're going to hunker down as a Christian family and we're just going to take care of our own. Don't say that. If the, if the, if the job is hard, go out and attack the job and work harder at it than you, did it, than you ever did before. Number one. The efforts of the laborer. Not all labor is created equal. And the, the, the work of the labor, the effort that the laborer puts in will make a tremendous impact on the quality of the product. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 37 and 38, he said unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. There was a big harvest back then. There was a lot of work that needed to be done back then. And, and what Jesus said the laborers are few. He says, it's not that I'm not big enough to harvest it. He says, the laborers are few. It's a big job, but I only have few laborers. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I've spoken with missionaries, other missionaries, and I remember one particular conversation. There were several missionaries there, and the question was brought up, or the subject was brought up, what do you need the most? And all the missionaries there, they all needed money, they all needed prayer, they all had a need for, you know, like materials and maybe, uh, maybe supplies of various kinds. But the thing that they needed most was help. They said more than anything else, we would rather have a family come and help us on our mission field as we're planting this church more than any money that a church would come. And I'll just go, I'll just, I'll just go ahead and second that. If you gave me the choice between $100,000 or one person coming and helping me even for just three months, I'll say you keep the $100,000. I would rather have an extra laborer in my church because the work is that great. Brother Minot, you should be blessed incredibly blessed having the folks go out you to Nevada. That is going to be such a huge blessing for you. Because a lot of the times, you know, I, I, a lot of times I'm doing the work myself. I have a small church. My parents are part of the church, but they're already busy to, taking care of certain things. There's a lot of responsibilities that fall on the missionary himself. There's a lot of labor that needs to get done. And the more laborers that jump in and the, the more that they put in a good quality effort, the better it will be. You know, look throughout our country and even in our own homes. How much is accomplished by a lazy person? Not much. A lazy child will never clean their room. A lazy employee will never turn a profit for their company. A, labor, a lazy church member will never show up when they're needed. Lazy laborers sit in an easy chair while there's lost souls who pass away into hell. My dad earlier this year was... Uh, he was checking out a new bank. He wanted to switch banks. And uh, he switched banks, and there was a young person who was working at a teller, and they made a mistake. And he needed to go in and speak with the manager and uh, sort out the mistake that the individual had made. And my dad suggested, he says, this is just a simple error. The person should have caught this. He says, you should fire that person. And the manager says, I can't fire him because... Uh, he, he's a young person, he comes in when he wants, he leaves when he wants, but if I fire him, the next person will be just as irresponsible and there's no one else. Hey, there's a need for good laborers everywhere. Not all labor is created equal. If you want to see people get saved, maybe you should start doing something about it and laboring even more about it. When we look in the book of Acts and we look at the apostles and the labor that the apostles did, which apostle in your mind stands out as the apostle who labored the most? From the apostle Paul. You're, over half the book of Acts is everything that he did. Well, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle Paul says, I am the least of the apostles, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Now, he says this under the inspiration of God. This is not him boasting. He says, I'm the least of the apostles, but I labored more than they all. There's a reason why Paul was so successful in his ministry endeavors. He poured himself. He spent every last drop of energy he had trying to reach unbelievers for the cause of Christ. Folks, the greater the effort, the greater the harvest. Perhaps one of the reasons why we are not seeing people saved in this barren land, we can't just blame it all on the soil. 
Maybe one of the reasons why we're not seeing more people saved is because of a lack of quality labor. Number two, the quantity of the seed. The quantity of the seed also has an impact on what kind of harvest you reap. Uh, I'm going to turn to Galatians chapter 6. You can turn with me if you would like. Galatians chapter 6 teaches some principles about sowing and reaping. Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse number 7. I'll wait till everyone's there. I don't like reading a scripture when I still hear pages turning. I want everybody to, if you're going to turn there, I want everyone to see what they're reading. All right, Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7. The Bible says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And I see two principles that are very clear in this passage. First of all, you always reap what you sow. If you plant a garden and you plant tomatoes, you will get tomatoes. If you plant a garden and you plant watermelons, you will get watermelons. You're not going to get corn. You're not going to get strawberries. You will reap what you sow. We have a barren land here. I wonder if we are reaping what we are sowing. And that is we haven't sowed, and so we're not reaping. Another principle is you always reap more than what you sow. My mom one year decided to plant cayenne peppers. She planted 100 cayenne pepper seeds. And of those 100 cayenne pepper seeds, four plants came up. And she watered them and she tended them. Off of one of those plants, she got 75 cayenne peppers. Off the other three, she got about another 75 cayenne peppers. She dried all of those cayenne peppers, and I praise the Lord that my dad needed me to work the day that she decided to grind them up. So I go off to work, and my brother got stuck at home with my mom grinding up these cayenne peppers. And when we got home, the, the house, there was a haze in the entire house of cayenne pepper dust everywhere. And there's, um, I don't know how my mom got through it, but there's my brother. He had gotten out his snorkeling gear. He had his goggles on. He had his, his um, oh, I forget what you call it, the snorkel on. He had a, a paper towel wrapped around uh, the top part. And he says, this is the only way I can breathe. And there he is trying to grind up these cayenne peppers into powder. And that was, uh, that was about 15 years ago. And my mom still has half a quart left of those cayenne peppers that she's used up. She planted 100 seeds. She got four plants. She got dozens of cayenne peppers. And she is still 15 years later using up those cayenne peppers you reap what you sow. You also reap a lot more than what you sow. So why aren't we seeing a great harvest these days? The quantity of the seeds is just not there. You know, it stands to reason that the more you go out and witness to people, the better chances there, are, there is of seeing someone get saved. You know, think of it this way. How many doors must be knocked before someone is willing to speak to you? How many tracts must be handed out before one is read? How many people must you invite to church before someone visits? How many conversations must be had before a person believes? It stands to reason if you have very little contact, very little conversations, then you will have very little fruit. But the more you go out and witness to someone and talk to people, whoever it is, the better chances there are of seeing someone get saved. Now, the, the numbers that I'm about to give here, these are not... Um, these are not precise. I don't know what they actually are, but as, as someone who's been church planting for the past couple of years, this is how it feels to me. I, I, I feel as though I go out and I talk to a thousand people, and out of those 1,000 people, 100 decide to come out to church. And out of those 100 people, about 10 decide to come out back to church for a second time. And out of those 10 people who come out to church a second time, one person, maybe one person will get saved. Now those are, not, those are not exact figures like I said, but that's what it feels. If those were exact figures, then you know what I say? Let's go out and let's talk to a thousand people. The quantity of the seeds makes an impact on what kind of harvest we're reaping. Number three, 
the quality of the soil. Now, I realize that soil can be barren, but there are things that a farmer can do to improve the quality of that soil. Think about the four different kinds of soil, the wayside. The wayside is, 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 like, a, is like a path. The, the dirt has been beaten down and trodden upon. It's packed down, and, and there's no way for a seed to get down into the dirt and, and take any root whatsoever. The seeds just land on top, and the birds can come along and devour them. Well, you can, it might be hard, but you can till that soil up. It may be very difficult, but what is a farmer going to do if he wants to make a, a wayside, a beaten down section of earth into a productive field? He's going to get the tractor out, he's going to get the plow out, and he's going to till it over, and he's going to till it over again, he's going to till it over again, till it over again, he's going to fertilize it, he's going to let the rain fall on it, and, and, and over time that can pre become more productive. Stones can be, can be moved, can be removed. In Schuylkill County, there's farmers all over the place, and they all have great big piles of rocks. And, and I don't mean a pile of rocks like the size of this piano. I mean a pile of rocks that's 10, 15 feet high for as long as this building is. And, and it's probably 20 feet, 30 feet wide. And, and over the years, they've gotten rocks, and it's not like little stones. It's big rocks. Some of them weigh hundreds of pounds, and they get their machine out, and they, they drag it. They push it over to the side. If there's rocky soil, you can pull the rocks out. What about thorns? Well, thorns may be a little difficult, but you can pull those out too. You can go, you can grab those thorns, you can grab those weeds, you can pull them out and you can cast them out to the side. And even good ground can be made better. Good ground can be fertilized. There's never been a farmer who said, oh, well, that's good ground. I can just forget about that. No, every farmer, he's looking out for his fields. He's going to let it rest one year. He's going to spread fertilizer and the cow manure and the chicken manure and the stinkier the better. Each one can be improved upon. What's the quality of your soil? Go to work in your soil. Go to work with the people that you know that you are in contact with. I will never have the opportunity to minister to the people here at Nashua, New Hampshire. You will probably never have the opportunity to minister to the people in Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania. But go to work in your, in, in your field, in your soil. Improve the quality of your soil. You know, the Bible refers to Jesus as the Lord of the harvest. Jesus said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. I heard an illustration one time from a missionary who was a missionary to uh, South Korea. And in, in the Asian mindset, the people are very, well, here in America, we're very individualistic. I'm going to go out and accomplish this. I will accomplish this. But in, 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 Asian, in Asian culture, they're very community oriented. We as a community will accomplish this. And this missionary was uh, standing up on a mountaintop and he was speaking with an older farmer. And this older farmer, they were looking, it was harvest time and they were both looking out at uh, the many fields. And this older farmer says to the missionary, you know, I used to be the Lord of the harvest. The missionary perked up his ears and says, oh, what does that mean? He says, oh, don't you know? He says, every harvest time, the farmers all get together and we elect a Lord of the harvest. And the Lord of the harvest decides who harvests which field. He decides who works together as a team. And he, he decides all these different decisions. And he says, I used to hold that position. He says, I can't do it anymore. But uh, he says, but, I, I, but he, he was watching. He says, you see, you see those people he, in that field? Those guys make a good team. Whoever's the Lord of the harvest this year, they're doing a good job. And I like what they're doing over here. And he started talking about these things. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. He puts us in places. He puts us in different fields. And your job is to reap a harvest for him in that field. What's the quality of your soil? Improve the quality of your soil. Let me ask a question. How can one improve the quality of the soil? Well, I'd say a couple of things. One, you have to, you have to, be, you have to begin by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And of course, your, your walk, your lifestyle had better uh, back up your talk. Your walk talks louder than your talk talks. But let me just add this. You need to love them. There are certain people, and, and you, there are certain people in your life who you know, that person loves me. So-and-so loves me. 
And there are so many unbelievers out there, they have no idea what true, legitimate love is. And they throw themselves towards all kinds of addictive substances and such. They, they pour themselves in all kinds of things. And so many, so many young people, the reason so many young people get caught up in atheism and, and all this liberalism is because they go to a university and they finally find someone who they think loves them. And this college professor shows them a little, bit of, a little bit of care about their lives. And before they know it, their mind is twisted sometimes forever. They're looking for someone to love them. Show unbelievers that you love them. I've had a couple unbelievers. Now, I don't consider unbelievers my friends, but I do befriend unbelievers. And I've had a couple of unbelievers. Uh, one in particular told me I was one of the best friends he ever had simply because I was willing to come and sit with him and tell him that I cared about him. Because I care about you, I want to open this book and tell you about Jesus who cares about you even more. Be that kind of a friend, that kind of a person where you can walk into their home, show up at their house, and they, they, they might say, I don't like what you're going to tell me. They might say, I, I, I don't believe what you believe, but I know you care about me. If someone knows that you care about them, there will always be an open door. Show them that you love them. So, the four ways to improve, to improve the, the barren land. One, the effort of the laborer. Two, the quantity of the seeds. Three, the quality of the soil. And four, the blessing of God. There is no way to measure the blessing of God. You can count the number of gospel tracts you pass out. You can count the number of conversations you have with, with uh, unbelievers, but there's no way to measure the blessing of God. And that's because it is far greater than you or I can ever believe, can, can ever understand. But in John 16 and verse 8, Jesus, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he says, When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to unbelievers. And I have some individuals in my church who their, their spouse is not living for the Lord or is not saved. And every now and then one of them will come to me and they're like, it's just, why is it, why is it so hard? I want them to get saved so much. And I say, you know what, you just keep being the person that God wants you to be. Show good character. Be a good, godly, loving spouse. And I take them to this verse and I say, see, you may not realize it, you may not see it, but God is convicting your spouse of sin. And God is convicting your spouse of the righteousness of Christ. And God is convicting your spouse of the judgment to come. You can witness to any unbeliever, every unbeliever that you meet at any time, God's Holy Spirit has already been convicting them of those three things. And the more that you present them with the Word of God, the more God's Holy Spirit has truth to be able to work with. And sometimes I wonder, are we limiting the power of God? Are we limiting the work, the work of God? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You cannot get saved if someone does not go and speak or show the words of God. Give God something to work with. Give Him an opportunity to, uh, you, you know, to take what the Scripture says and let the Holy Spirit bring that into their mind and to the remembrance and let the Holy Spirit convict them and work them over until, until they finally make that decision to pray and ask the Lord Jesus to be saved. First, uh, First Corinthians 3 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul says, I have, I have watered, uh, uh, excuse me, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. The Apostle Paul, he's going around, he's planting seeds. Apollos was going around, he's watering these seeds. And ultimately, God was the one who blessed those seeds and enabled the harvest to be reaped. I like to think that God meets man halfway. You see, when you do what you can do, then God will step in and he will do what he can do. I mean, think of it, God doesn't need your money. He already owns the cattle on a thousand hills, but he expects you to give. Uh, you can't save anybody. God is the one who saves, but He expects you to go and tell. When you do what you can do, then God will step in and He will do what He can do. So give God something to work with. God cannot bless His Word if it is never preached. God cannot bless the gospel if it's never shared. God cannot answer your prayers that are never asked. So get involved and, and, and do things. Pray, share the truth of God, share gospel seeds, and give God something to work with. When He has something to work with, then He can bless it. And even though it may be hard, and you know, I, in the past three and a half years, 
church planning is a lot of hard work. It is a lot of hard work. We've gone through some discouraging times in the last couple of years, and, and in a sense, these past, probably these past four or five months have, have been another discouraging time uh, f for my wife and I. It kind of comes in cycles, but it, and sometimes it just seems really hard. But you got to get out there and you got to give God something to work with because when God does work, it is awesome. I remember the first gentleman that I had the privilege to baptize. I, I, don't, I don't count how many people, you know, make a profession of faith. I count how many people make a profession of faith, come to church, and decide to be baptized. When they decide to be baptized, that's when they're saying, okay, yes, I'm, I'm going to be a real Christian now. I'm going to be a real Christian now. And uh, my dad let a gentleman bill to the Lord. And Bill started coming to church, and he came to our, he came to our Christmas service. And uh, a couple weeks later, he came to me and says, I think I need to be baptized. So we started talking, and uh, at the end of February in 2020, uh, 2021, I was able to baptize Bill. And that was such an awesome experience. He was one gentleman, one man, but he was the first person that we were able to add to Amazing Grace Baptist Church. And we've seen others. I had the privilege in 2022 to lead an 85-year-old lady to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then she asked for baptism, and so I was able to baptize her. Last summer, there was another lady who started coming to church. She, she had a problem in her life, and she, she was really concerned, and she said, I really need God in my life. And she, she, of all churches, she decided to come to our church. And after several months of attending, she finally trusted Christ and she was saved and she was baptized and her Catholic husband and a, a number of Catholic uh, relatives were also there. When God does work, it is incredibly awesome. So let's stop complaining about the barrenness of the field. If no one is getting saved, the problem is not the soil. The problem is not the seed. The problem is not the harvest. And the problem is definitely not the Lord of the harvest. And let me go a step further the problem is not Democrats. Okay? They're not the problem with America. Sin is the problem with America. The problem is with the laborers. If there's anything that, that can be done, anything that was within our power to impact the harvest, it is our efforts as a laborer sowing seeds, working the soil, and doing something that to, 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 to merit the blessing of God. Doing something to say, okay, God, I can't save them. I've done everything I can do. I've prayed for this person. I've spoken to this person. I've invited this person. There's nothing else that I can do. God, at this point, you have got to reach down and touch their soul. So go out and do it. What kind of laborer are you? I challenge you, put in your best effort. Sow a lot of seeds Improve the quality of the, your soil so that God can bless you, bless your labors, and God can reap a harvest in your field. I'm going to close with a word of prayer. I'll turn it back over to Pastor. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, for its truth, for its power. Father, my heart is greatly burdened tonight because I love this country and I love the Christian heritage that we have here, but America as a whole is turning her back on God. And the reason for that is because individual people all over America are turning their back on God. People say that they're Christians, but they're not. People say that they're good, but they're actually wicked. And the only thing, the only thing that can change this country or any person is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, I hope it is not too late. Father, I pray and I ask that in Pennsylvania and in New Hampshire and in Nevada, I pray that you would enable the churches to reap a harvest in spite of the barren land. Father, you are greater. You are the Lord of the harvest. You've assigned us these fields. You, you love the world. You died on the cross so that people could be saved. Father, I pray that we would do what we can do so that you will do what you can do and so that people can be at, saved, baptized, and added to your churches. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.